Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. So, how many of you have been to Dubai in this audience? <laughs> Very alluring place. Um, many reasons to go. I'm sure you all know about the seven-star malls and uh, indoor skiing, high-end shopping. Um, but uh, Dubai is famous for its many tourist attractions. And uh, on the surface, it looks like an entrepreneur's dream with... Uh, ease of investment, ease to obtain loans and other facilities, the readiness of the UAE government to back projects, um, the property development market. Um, it's no wonder why Dubai International Airport has one of the highest levels of traffic in the world. The image presented by the UAE to the world is extremely alluring, as if money is just flowing through the ether. And if that image were true, the UAE would be nothing short of a miracle. When the global financial crisis hit in 2007, despite high oil prices, the UAE was in a uniquely vulnerable position, and that's because they diversified their income to open up regional markets, trade between Asia, Africa, and other Middle Eastern countries, uh, property development, but the problem was with their high oil prices, it impacted on the uh, Property development companies, small businesses found it uh, difficult to ship. And with the high energy use in the UAE, lots of businesses went under. Once the economic meltdown became full-blown a few years later, more and more import expert businesses were struggling with loan defaults. Suppliers were going bankrupt, and the country was littered with halted construction projects. Uh, we saw it all over the television, documentaries on uh, ghost developments, and people lost a lot of money having paid uh, in advance for construction. Villas purchased just six months earlier lost two-thirds of their value as expats were desperate to sell, trying to escape mortgages they could no longer afford, often due to redundancy. Even the UAE had a practice of pumping money into local banks from the country's massive sovereign wealth fund in Abu Dhabi as a safeguard against defaults. But banks were still under pressure to remain profitable, also continuing to lend in the hopes of navigating the crisis. This is when we began to see a doubling down by the banks against bounce checks, which is a criminal offence in the UAE, no matter the circumstances. It's black and white. If a check bounced, not due to any fault of your own, you would be uh, convicted of the crime of bounce checks. And each check can um, warrant a three-year prison sentence. We actually saw uh, one company uh, struggled financially and bounced a series of checks, and a British man was jailed for 42 years. Um, he finally was, was released due to government pressure about, I think it was 12 years later. But as you can see, any entrepreneurial activities in the UAE can be highly dangerous. Uh, banks like Dubai Islamic Bank even started to call in loans worth hundreds of millions of dollars without warning in a panic to maintain liquidity. Local business partners in expat businesses began trying to push foreign partners out, and even the governments of various emirates started seizing companies. If you had a successful business between 2008 and 2013, you were more at risk than if you had an unsuccessful business. Businesses were looted by not only the government, local business partners, but also banks. The total population of the UAE is around uh, 9.5 million, with Emirati citizens constituting around 10% of that number. The Emirati population is largely made up of some 40 or so tribes, and within those tribes, a few prominent families. The ruling families like the Al Maktoums, Al Nayans, and Al Qasimis. Many highly influential families, such as Grafi, Suwadi, and Mullah, and others may not hold government positions, but nevertheless exert tremendous power within the country. These are extremely large, sprawling familial networks with controlling influence across society. A single individual, furthermore, while may simultaneously hold an important political position and a position in law enforcement, as well as being a leading figure in the private sector. 
Relationships exist that create what in the West we would recognize as conflict of interest, but pass in the UAE without comment. So for example, the chairman of DIB Bank may force a foreclosure of a property development worth one billion by leveling a false accusation of fraud against the foreign developer who took the loan from the bank. Never scrutinized is the fact that DIB chairman is also a board member on the property development companies, nor the fact that he's the head of the security police, nor the fact he's in charge of the ruler's court. The foreign developer in this scenario stands no chance whatsoever of successfully defending himself. We have one such case right now where a, a British national has been detained for over 10 years uh, on this exact scenario. His company was looted by the bank and he was even later pardoned by the ruler but remains in custody because the bank has the legal option to keep him in prison so long as he hasn't paid the amount that they've demanded, which is 500 million. Despite the fact that the bank recovered a property worth 1 billion when they only lent him 500 million to start with. It's a profoundly tribal society, and as such, who you are and who you know often determines what you can do and how you will be treated. There is an Arabic term for the networking influence called wasta. It connotes not so much the actual power an individual may have, but the privilege they enjoy through their proximity to those in power. While there have been some attempts to rein it in over the years and install anti-corruption police, nothing has actually been done to change that situation. The dynamics between influential families and between individuals in those networks is one of the most formidable and unpredictable elements about doing business in the Emirates. Foreigners in the UAE, regardless of how long they have lived there, are repeatedly regarded as outsiders, and their investments can easily be treated by locals as short-term injections of cash ripe for the taking. From over 10 years of experience in the region, I have observed that the primary concern of any Emirati partner, creditor, or sponsor is to improve his or her own status within the familiar and tribal network, even if that comes at the expense of a trusting foreign partner client or worker, and even if it means breaching contractual relations and falsifying criminal charges against them, the legal system in the country will back the Emirati wholesale. There is not a consideration. There are, you can say, two UAEs. One is an illusion and one is real. The illusion is that of modern, liberal and business-friendly country open to foreigners. This is the image that draws thousands of people to the UAE every month. The real Emirates is an extremely small, insulated community of locals who operate within a strictly traditional tribal framework, almost completely beyond the pale of official regulation or legal process. The longer a foreigner is able to exist in the UAE without ever coming into contact or conflict with Emiratis, the longer the illusion may continue for them. But the moment their lives or careers or finances or companies become connected to a local or connected to someone who has power within the local community, the moment they experience a dispute with that Emirati, the illusion will immediately disappear. And they will come face to face with the harsh reality of the UAE that it is in fact a banana republic whose police, prosecutors, courts and governments are all instruments for serving the interests of the locals. Perhaps the best way to approach discussing the risks to investors and business people in the UAE is to talk about risks to foreigners in general under an arbitrary, underdeveloped legal system with no semblance of due process. This will give you an overall context for the environment. A very good example of this is uh, the consumption of alcohol. It would appear when you travel to Dubai that consuming alcohol is perfectly legal. You are provided alcohol in flights, there's alcohol at the airports, there's bars and, and restaurants freely serving alcohol. However, what you don't know, probably, is that tourists are not allowed to drink alcohol at all in Dubai. It's completely illegal. The only people who are allowed to consume alcohol are um, expats who have an alcohol license, but that alcohol license only gives them the ability to drink in the privacy of their home or hotel room. 
if they have any alcohol content in their blood in public, that's a criminal offence, and we've seen people arrested. Uh, a recent case, perhaps you might have seen it in the media last year, is a woman was arrested on arrival in Dubai. She had consumed one glass of wine on the government's national airline. She was then charged for having alcohol in her blood. <clears throat> Even if you know the law about drinking or anything else, it's not a guarantee that you'll be safe from arrest or conviction. Police in the UAE rely heavily on the witness testimony of others. That means that they will take as holy grail a witness statement against you and they will do little more to investigate that allegation. So that puts the power of arrest in the hands of the general public. Um, the only thing that they will generally do to confirm their allegation is to obtain a witness statement from yourself, a confession, and that confession is usually coerced, or in some cases people have even been tortured to obtain the confession. Once the confession is obtained, it's 100% conviction. Court-appointed attorneys, as well as highly paid private lawyers, function in the UAE court system primarily to facilitate quick judgments against their own clients. They usually do not meet their clients and clients have no say in the defence offered by counsel. Very often their lawyers don't even speak English. Many private attorneys are former employees of the public prosecutor's department and maintain a sense of loyalty to their colleagues. Prosecutors are 100% Emirati nationals, while judges and uh, defense counsel are usually Egyptian or uh, from another country in the Gulf region. Um, essentially, the lawyers themselves, the judges and uh, police are all looking to secure convictions. They do, uh, they have been alleged to um, receive bonus payments for successful prosecutions. And within the legal system, everyone, I mean, the, the lawyers and the judges basically want to please the ruler's court. And that means if they're on visas, and those visas are taken away if they don't give favorable judgments to local Emiratis. Now, superimpose all the proceeding upon the business world, and you will begin to see the inherent multiple and lethal risks to anyone investing in such an environment. The overwhelming majority of cases that we handle are related to business and financial disputes, and in the UAE, such matters inevitably become criminal cases, particularly when foreigners find themselves at odds with Emiratis. Uh, by way of scenario, a successful businessman opens a company in Dubai under a 50-50 partnership arrangement with his local sponsor. The Emirati was from a high prominent family and he felt very stable with his investment. Uh, the Emirati partner wasn't actively involved in the business and simply took um, uh, annual profits until he grew this business into what was worth 500 million pounds, uh, British pounds, that is. And at this point, he thought that the local partner would be very pleased with him. Uh, alas, she demanded that he sell her his 50% share, which would be worth 250 million, for a mere 250,000. He thought this was a joke. And, uh, and, and laughed it off until he uh, received a threat from her that if he didn't hand over the shares for the 250,000, she would um, put him in jail. He then turned up at his office and he'd been locked out. His electricity and power had been cut off from his house and he realized that he was in a very difficult situation. He left the country immediately, um, knowing how these things can escalate in the UAE when coming across a powerful person. Then, Amazingly, the woman in this case hired a, a very, very prominent lawyer who's also a friend of uh, Sheikh Mohammed, the ruler of Dubai, who is also uh, the head of the Dubai International Arbitration Center and who also is uh, with a top five law firm. Um, he then took this case to court and he represented his client, the Emirati, in the same court also represented our client, 
who had no knowledge that he was being represented by this lawyer. So we had a lawyer in a court representing both the claimant and the respondent, and they used this courtroom to essentially plead guilty to charges of embezzlement. So that led to the absolute theft of his entire um, £250 million prop profit, and that was then gifted to a member of the royal family, obviously purchasing more Wasta. Uh, fortunately, he was safe in England. I think if he'd remained in the UAE, he would be like many others who have been there for decades in prison. Um, but, I mean, that, that one is particularly astonishing that this high-profile lawyer was able to get away with doing that, and it's completely evidenced in all of the documentation, and the judge fully allowed it without contestation. Uh, and then, just to top it off so that he could not come back to the UAE at any time, he was put on the Interpol database. So this is another serious risk to investors in the UAE. Even if they do leave the country, they can be put on the Interpol database wrongfully. And this happens frequently for the purpose of preventing that person from coming back to the UAE to make a claim in the civil courts in the event of any dispute. Now, obviously, an Interpol notice shouldn't have been issued in the first place, and I, I do a lot of work removing people from Interpol, but it's, it's being misused not only for extortion to obtain money from people, but also to force them to sign over shares or company assets. It also allows them to recover any assets that are currently in the UAE from the investor, whether that's a villa or a business or any other company assets. A uh, sl slightly less disastrous but recurring scenario, you have a company in Dubai, again with a local partner. You're running the business, but the local partner is authorised to access the corporate bank account. The local partner treats the company like his personal ATM, and then the cheques that you have written to suppliers bounce. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, three-year sentence for each cheque, even though you had no control over any of the dealings. There are innumerable ways that this can happen. A check can bounce due to a normal disruption of funds, a client arbitrarily pulling out of a deal. One of the most common tricks in the UAE when a creditor takes a security check from you as collateral against a loan. So for example, if we uh, take out a loan, a company loan or a mortgage um, for a million dollars, we will give the bank a check for, the, for a million dollars. And we might pay back $950,000 of that and they will bounce the check and that would be three years in prison. Um, alternatively, in some cases, the bank or a company, whoever you've written the cheque to, has bounced the cheque that was never supposed to be presented, even though you have maintained your contractual agreements. Um, the moment you have bounced a cheque in the UAE, you're a criminal, and you will face not one punishment, but a series of punishments. The total accumulation of which usually results in the complete ruin of your life. You'll be given a jail sentence for each check that's bounced, your assets can be seized, your business will collapse, your reputation destroyed. And you may end up staying in prison well beyond your official sentence because you still have to pay the commercial uh, amount of the check back to the um, recipient. If you're fortunate enough to flee the UAE, you will likely be on Interpol. Once you're on Interpol, as you can imagine, life is extremely difficult and it's very hard to do business when you cannot travel for fear of being arrested. The UAE will seize the opportunity of your immobility and whatever assets you may have left behind in the country will be devoured and very likely new cases will be brought against you which you're powerless to challenge. The lack of transparency and accountability of the Interpol, Interpol system is a topic in itself. I'm in fact putting together a comprehensive proposal on um, covering Interpol and international standards of extradition which have rendered so many American and, uh, and foreign nationals subject to abuse. Another emirate which has been largely marketing in uh, the US is uh, Ras Al Khaimah, I'll call it RAC. Uh, they've been marketing their free trade zone authority and uh, as an offshore center for investment. It's important to understand that the largest businesses in any individual emirate are always connected to the government. 
and that the government is always the controlling stakeholder in any company in the UAE, simply because they control everything. And when the government wants to do something, there's no recourse. Perhaps the most egregious example of this was what occurred when the ruler of Ras al Khaimah died. His successor undertook a scorched earth policy against anyone his father had employed. He unilaterally cancelled contracts, and this is a subject that deserves its own speech, and I don't want to bore you with all of the details, but I think it's important to mention the case of Mr. Osama al Amari, who's a US national. He's currently on Interpol and has been fighting with um, the Ras al Khaimah government in the courts of New York. In 2000, Ras al Khaimah ruler Sheikh Zakir bin Mohammed al Qasimi appointed his son Faisal to oversee the Free Trade Zone Authority. Faisal hired Usama al Amari to lead the ambitious project, and within a few short years of CEO, al Amari succeeded in turning it into the best emerging free zone in the world. However, there were rivalries within the royal family that brought this success to a screeching halt with the death of Sheikh Sakir in 2010. Faisal's brother Saud seized control after his father's death. Sheikh Saud launched a smear campaign against Faisal in order to disqualify him from succession. Sheikh Saud accused his brother of mismanaging the Free Trade Zone Authority and alleged the senior staff, including Al Amari, were guilty of embezzlement and breach of trust. Anyone who had worked under Faisal was tarred in Sheikh Saud's campaign, and most, if not all, of the pending investment agreements at the time were unilaterally nullified by Saud, and that included international projects, ports, malls, uh, anything that his brother had, had touched. He entirely killed it. He had uh, a client of mine even arrested in Georgia. Uh, he was using his influence and power in countries that perhaps don't have um, a mature legal system in order to have them return money to him. He was simply trying to recoup as much money as he could uh, now that he was in power. That is how quickly accolades can turn into allegations in the UAE. Even the foreigners with whom the Free Trade Zone Authority had contractual relations just to negate those agreements, just to emphasize. These were contracts were ongoing successful projects with foreign partners and Sheikh Saud not only canceled the contracts but created criminal charges against the partners just to pull out the deals and smear the reputation of Faisal. There's still remaining four uh, people in prison in, uh, in Iraq at the moment that have been victims of essentially this smear campaign. There's no safety derived from partnering with the government. Indeed, such partnerships are the most dangerous for foreigners. On another note, on Rack, there is a French gentleman in prison at the moment. Uh, Customs, if he ran a successful uh, car manufacturing business. Customs turned up and asked him for 20%, although he was not obliged to pay. He, again, he thought it was a joke. But they um, then looted his business, they cancelled his contracts, they uh, shut down his factory and then took out criminal allegations against him and caused, again, checks to bounce, which means that he is still stuck in the UAE. As I've said, the greatest proportion of our work deals with business and financial cases in the UAE and broader GCC. And the, these issues that I'm talking about with the UAE also extend to uh, Qatar, um, where I've been receiving a lot of feedback of exactly the same issues. Any threat an investor can encounter in the Gulf, we have dealt with. We know how to anticipate it and navigate. <clears throat> I think to, to finish that one off, um, what I would say, I think I've given you quite a, a sort of broad spectrum um, analysis of the risks that are involved in uh, investing in the UAE. And I think that we could probably say that any, anyone who goes there, whether it's a, an investor, a tourist, or an expat, really needs to watch out for um, what they've possibly done in the past that they could be arrested for in the UAE. And that can extend, I don't know whether any of you saw that someone was recently arrested for calling someone a horse on Facebook. And that, that case was um, just last week. 
And the Facebook post was made from outside of the UAE three years ago. So anything that you have said on social media, on Twitter, on, on, uh, in public, it can even be in a WhatsApp message privately, uh, you can be subject to arrest if someone, generally, if someone reports you for that. So that law can be quite misused by people who consider you an enemy. If, for example, you were uh, visiting Dubai to investigate uh, a fraud, and the, the person knew that you were coming, they could scowl through all of your historical tweets and find something that the UAE sees as offensive and report you and have you arrested for that, thereby thwarting your ability to continue with your investigation. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no freedom of press, and speaking negatively about the government of the UAE is an imprisonable offence, and saying anything that would negatively impact the reputation of the UAE. And the government actually recently issued a warning telling people not to discuss the rain in public on social media, bad weather or a, an airline incident that would negatively impact the uh, government's airline. Um, there was another warning about sharing fake news. So even if you didn't know it was fake news and you retweet uh, an existing news story, you can again face uh, imprisonment for that. There was a warning about discussing the escape by Princess Latifa. So I think that expats know not to do this um, so much, but def definitely investors who visit the location uh, should be well aware of these pitfalls. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are any questions? <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> yes. always seen with Dubai and we hear more about as I've uh, worked uh, especially in the former Soviet Union is the amount of money that goes through Dubai um, <clears throat> and the number of known organized crime figures who make homes in Dubai so my question is two part number one is how does corruption come into this in terms of allowing these people who let's put it this way there isn't a Russian that I've ever met who's an organized crime member who's gonna stop drinking uh, so uh, he would immediately be, in theory, according to what you've just said, have problems with the, with the uh, prohibition against alcohol policy. But there must be some way that he's getting around it. So how does corruption show itself, not just in personal you know, interactions, but also in business interactions, but most importantly in money laundering situations? And the second uh, question I have is, is how does this play out? So, like I said, what we're seeing now is more uh, corrupt money, you know, from Eastern and Central Europe going through Dubai. How does it work out with the banks in Dubai when they have foreign clients like that um, who are bringing money in? Is there, you know, do they have the expectation or is there always a risk that they might lose this money due to, you know, the current uh, legal situation in Dubai? Thank you. Uh, I, I would say that they would have a, a risk, of course, but corruption is a, a real problem in the UAE. It has been for the 10 years that I've been uh, working and detained in Dubai. Uh, as far as money laundering is concerned, well, Dubai is a huge hub for that. Uh, in fact, just the other day I was contacted by someone who was a whistleblower over uh, a gold scandal in, in Dubai. Now, apparently when he... Um, wanted to speak about it, they tried to lure him to come to Dubai, obviously to level uh, false charges against him. Uh, he was smart enough not to go, but this is a standard operation procedure. The Dubai government is well aware of everything that is going on, on under the nose, and this goes all the way up to the ruling level. Corruption is prevalent, and that's in the legal system, uh, in the political system. Uh, it, it's everywhere, and they... they do allow the money to go through there, that's for sure. I've dealt with clients who, um, who have been, uh, you know, fully knowledgeable of these uh, transfers being made through the banks. The banks will, you know, I mean, they're, they're run by Emiratis and their sole purpose is to make money and they will turn a blind eye. Um, I think that the UAE is increasingly belligerent in their, uh, their um, attitude towards the West. I think that they really are arrogant in the sense that they will do whatever they want um, 
whether, whether there is complaint from the UK government or the US, I think that the US and the UK in particular see them, see the UAE as one of their strongest allies in the Gulf. And I think that they do turn a blind eye largely to known corruption, to known embezzlement, to known money laundering. Yes, uh, Samad Khan from Kamasant. Uh, my question is uh, about the ruling UAE family. Like you have mentioned these instances of these bounce checks and these sort of things. My question is, is the royal family aware of all these issues? Do they read the, these newspapers? Because I think they try their best when these sort of issues happen so that they don't come into the press, although the press is censored there, but sometimes they give the uh, pardons and this sort of things. So. And then why, when the royal family is so particular about their privacy and these sort of things, then why do these issues occur? Why do they detain them when they, the news comes out in the West? Although there it's uh, blocked, but do, and plus, for example, they recently have this Ministry of Opportunity, Ministry of Happiness, and these sort of things, and a very positive image of UAE all over the world that it's open for business and all these sort of things. Then why are they not sorting out these issues, which I think are administrative type of matters which can be resolved if they have the will um, the UAE, in my opinion, doesn't have a strong public relations arm. They are very good at promotion. They, they have been selling to the West this uh, facade of what the UAE is, and that, that can be extended um, to... I mean, it's, it's why the country is so popular, because people, didn't, they're not aware of it. Um, the royal family is clearly aware of all of the problems in the legal system and the financial sector, the fact that bounce checks can lead to prison and that they are abused and misused. They uh, responded to press pressure by enacting bankruptcy laws recently, but in reality, that was just a facade. The bankruptcy laws don't apply in most situations and they haven't been available. So it was just really a marketing ploy. Um, I mean, you can see this with the tourism, that they had, I mean, no one had really spoken about all of the, the reasons that tourists get arrested, holding hands or sleeping with someone outside marriage, sharing a hotel room. Um, and I mean, we've even seen cases of rape victims be charged with having sex outside marriage. Um, and again, the alcohol consumption, just the most ridiculous things we've seen, and the Facebook post, the horse comment. I mean, we've seen sharing a charity on Facebook. So they've really only come under the kind of scrutiny, I think, recently, and, and certainly in the UK, uh, that, that's really increased over the past few years. But before that, they didn't have much scrutiny. And I think that when it comes to the financial crimes, when it comes to the way the, the bankruptcy laws and the balance checks, there hasn't, there's not too much general public interest in that topic. So it's harder to get those sorts of stories out into the media. It's easy to get someone, you know, sharing a charity on Facebook. Everyone wants to know about that, or being charged with alcohol abuse. But it's it's harder to, you know, find the audience for financial crimes in the general public. So th they haven't had as much pressure. On, on that as, as they really should have, and especially given that um, they're very serious about their marketing to the financial uh, sector and marketing their free trade zones um, and opening the doors to investors. I think it's something that they really need to look at, but just haven't yet. And I think that, you know, with enough pressure, probably we'll see those kind of changes in 30 years. But the other thing is you've got, you've got Emiratis who take advantage of these laws and they're profiting from them. So why would they want to change them when most of the Emiratis benefit from them? I think that they come under pressure from local tribes and local uh, prominent people who don't want those laws to be changed. And certainly even HSBC Bank came out in public and said, jailing debtors works. And they will jail someone for you know as little as 10,000. And I have people on Interpol for you know, just norm, normal average people on Interpol for a debt of 10,000 euros. Um, they don't want to change it. They use it. They like it. It works for them is exactly what he said. 
uh, as far as the ruling family, they're only responding to public pressure and pressure from, well, pressure from really within the local tribes who don't want the laws to change. They want to be able to use it. They want to be able to steal investments. They get more out of stealing investments from foreigners than they would if they made the, the country more attractive to foreigners to invest. Thanks, Rada. Steve Wilson from Constellation Research. Um, given that criticising the government is a problem in Dubai, and given your profile and your, um, your um, unvarnished comments, um, I'm wondering how you yourself function um, and how your company functions in Dubai and whether you um, actually spend any time in the place yourself. No, I, I, I would imagine that they would simply deport me on arrival. I don't think they'd want the big media fuss about it. Um, I, I don't go to Dubai. What, what I do is I work with local lawyers and, and people in the UAE. But often, I mean, a lot of our work to facilitate or to help people get released is private. It's negotiations, it's arbitration, or alternatively, uh, in many cases, it comes down to the pressure from the public or press campaigns. Yes. I mean, the, the DIFC, Dubai International Financial Centre, um, which has a panel of British uh, former High Court judges, I believe, um, so far we, we've had kind of mixed reports on it. We've had people saying that, or clients claiming that um, it has just, it's been just as corrupt because they're accepting evidence that has ultimately been fabricated outside of the DIFC courts. So if you're entering a dispute uh, for example, with an Emirati again, and that went to the DIFC, they're still going to be providing fabricated evidence that the DIFC doesn't tend to scrutinise as much as you would expect from, say, in, in the English legal system. Um, the Dubai Arbitration Centre, I, I couldn't recommend because that the, the person who heads that up is, is the lawyer that I told you about earlier who argued both cases. I think that, again, is facing corruption. I wouldn't choose the DIFC courts as a jurisdiction, and I don't trust them entirely, but we'll see how they go. It's a new thing. Radha Dilip Masan from SAS Asset Recovery. Um, I actually live in the UAE and have <laughs> lived there for the last 10 years, and uh, am involved in global litigation funding and asset recovery. <clears throat> I'm curious, you know, you talked about Dubai, you talked about Ras Al Khaimah. What is your opinion of Abu Dhabi, and have you had any experience in dealing in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi? Or, yeah, I mean, and they I, now also have Abu Dhabi Global Markets, yeah. and you know, there's a lot of interesting tension in the society as the federal government is trying to make changes, and locals are resisting. Um, so there's a there's a lot going on in the ground level um, that you may not necessarily be perceiving and you know I appreciate what you do but I really like to know what you your opinion of Abu Dhabi is and what your experience is there I mean Abu Dhabi has a stronger relationship with the United States than um, than Dubai I think Dubai le leans more towards England and Abu Dhabi towards the US I believe that Abu Dhabi is extremely disappointed with the um, situation in Ras al Khaimah with, with uh, what I was speaking about earlier with this uh, purging and the reputation that that is kind of giving the UAE. I think that Abu Dhabi is often embarrassed by Dubai as well. Um, Abu Dhabi, the legal system from my point of view has been much slower and um, certainly faces exactly the same issues that I've discussed, in, you know, focusing on Dubai. Um, but I also think that the, I mean, there's contest between the Emirates, and I think that Abu Dhabi is probably, hopefully, leading um, in wanting to make those changes and wanting to uh, preserve the reputation of the country. But I think with so much going on, it's just going to take a long time. influence, but then again, they have to let the economy function in the 
Yeah, I mean, the bankruptcy laws were a good step, in a sense, but they didn't seem to work in reality. And even Al Tamimi, the leading law firm, has criticised the bankruptcy laws, I think. They, they don't offer the kind of protection that an investor needs, but they might, you know, they might be beneficial for, as you, as you described, but I don't think... Well, I, I think that's the issue with the UAE, is that they write legislation without thinking about it. I mean, look at the, if you look at the cybercrime laws, they were not drafted very effectively. And I think it's the same thing with the bankruptcy laws. They push it through, they, and, and it's a disaster. I mean, they, yes, they're new, but if you're coming from making new legislation, now's the time to get it right, really, not pass the legislation and develop it. I mean, I'll also touch back on uh, what you mentioned about the free trade zones, and I will say that uh, that is a step in the right direction, obviously, taking away the um, requirement to have a local sponsor. Um, but that doesn't protect people against the kind of risks that I've just discussed. Um, and in Resol came a free trade zone. Uh, they still had the issues. They still had the uh, the corruption. They still had the legal abuse. And they still had you know other people trying to take advantage of them. So the free trade zone doesn't help, although it's a great step in the direction. Yeah. Thanks. I was just kind of curious, given the trajectory that you've you've articulated, um, whether you think it will get better, um, if there's any sort of hope in that direction in some of these areas that you've addressed. Um, and I will just sort of say, as a, a, to buttress the earlier point, um, I'm Canadian and work in security misrepresentations. And uh, in Ontario, where I'm from, we only put that law in the books. Like the current standard for that came in in 2005. And if you read Canadian case law between 2005 and like 2012-ish, it's it's the it's such a mess because no one knew what was supposed to happen. So you know it's it's definitely it cuts across cultures. I think to have bad law written by your legislature. Yeah. But anyways, the, the broader point though is to to ask uh, you know what what is the trajectory you see? You know, is there actually enough civil society, even if it is limited in some way, or you know that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think. 
like like we see with Saudi, we start to see changes in the way that they treat women, or which, and it starts off as sort of marketing, but ultimately I think we will see those changes in Saudi. And likewise in the UAE, I think as a response to public demand and public pressure, um, they will ultimately be forced to change, but I think it's going to be very slow, and I think that people aren't going to be safe for at least the next 10 years. Um, it's deeply ingrained in the culture, it's deeply ingrained in the society, and when you've got the corporate sector wanting it to remain as it is, it's a huge push to change things. And uh, then we, we have several ruling families, we have federal law and local law, and all with different opinions and different strategies. So I really don't think that we're going to see an eradication of these, these types of legal abuses that I deal with on a daily basis in the near future. I mean, Although we are starting to publish more of these cases and people are starting to get concerned and we have Bloomberg and Reuters writing about them in the Financial Times, so I think when that happens and investors are worried enough, I think that they will have to balance that. And when the balance is that it's more beneficial for them to make those changes, I think they will. Excellent. <laughs> okay, I think we can go then. Yes. <laughs>